Hi, good morning. Um, so I'm Jen Goldbeck, and what I want to talk to you today about is something kind of like privacy online, but a little bit different. So when you think about privacy and social media, we tend to think about people that we don't want getting access to the information that we've put up online, right? And this is a really important problem, and it's something that computer scientists like me and privacy specialists have spent a lot of time thinking about. And it's a super important problem. But there's kind of a flip side of this. So we all probably have that guy that we're friends with on Facebook or Twitter, and he posts all the time and all kinds of stuff that we're not interested in, right? Like political rants or the viral video that everybody saw six months ago. And it's like you just want to like hide him, right? Block that guy. None of us want to be that guy, right? We want to be sharing interesting and useful content that people haven't seen before. And so that's a little bit different than privacy. But on the other hand, it's similar in that we're trying to control the message and the way we present ourselves. The problem is that the tools to do that in the way that we've kind of mastered in the offline world aren't very good online. So what I want to talk to you about today are some of those challenges and what they're rooted in, and then give a couple suggestions about where we might go with it. I'd like to start with this dramatic pie chart, right? <laughs> so Facebook did this study of over a thousand people. They interviewed them and they said, you know, how many people do you think see the things that you post on Facebook? And their answer was 20 on average. The average person said they think about 20 people see their posts. But in actuality, it was almost four times that. 78 people on average saw what people posted on Facebook. The, pe the people that took this survey also said they really wanted more people to see the stuff that they were posting, except they were underestimating by a factor of four how many people were seeing the things that they posted. So they wanted a bigger audience, but they actually had a bigger audience. And I think this study is interesting because it gets at the heart of the fact that we actually have no idea who sees the stuff that we post online. We have a really hard time understanding the audience, how big it is, and who it is. But that matters to us a lot. And uh, my favorite project to show that is one that a colleague of mine, Eric Gilbert, did. Um, when he was a graduate student working on his dissertation at the University of Illinois, he made this project called Link Different. And this was designed for Twitter, so you could take a link that you wanted to share, paste it into his tool, and it would give you a little chart like this that says, here's how many followers you have. So you have you know, 3,800 followers. 2,200 of them have already seen this link that you want to share. And it did that by going to your friends' profiles, looking at their friends and what they had posted, seeing if the link was in there. And so you would know if you were sharing that video that everyone's already seen, or if you were bringing new information to your friends. And this actually turns out to be a really important issue. Because when we share links with friends, we want them to be new and interesting, right? There's no reason to share a link that everyone has seen already. And this is rooted in a concept called social capital. All right, so we all know the term capital, and we think of that as money, right? So we go to work for someone, we do something and give them some value from our work, and they give us money. Social capital is basically the same thing, but instead of getting money from our friends, we're getting like social points, right? We're getting credit. And it's great if we're that guy that like you go to and that person is always sharing new and interesting stuff that you wouldn't have found before. So I have one of these friends on Facebook. We went to high school together. I don't think I've seen him since the mid-90s, but we're Facebook friends. And every day, he shares something interesting and exciting and new that I never would have found. And like just last week, I was like, you have the best stuff on Facebook. right? That's what we want to be. You get that social capital. So people trust what you say. They rely on you to bring them new and interesting content. And this tool was so popular that when it went online, it crashed the servers at the University of Illinois. And when I see people talk about this, you know, Eric Gilbert, the guy who made this, or when I mention it, people come up and they're like, I want that tool, right? I want to use that. Uh, and it doesn't exist anymore because it was a research project and it got taken down. So there's a demand for this kind of information that we know we're sharing new and interesting things. But there are actually no tools out there right now that let us see what that is. And there's one more compounding issue here. This is my Facebook network. Uh, each dot here represents a person, and if there's a line between them, that means that those people are friends on Facebook. Now, my network is a little bit unusual in that it's very separated. So I have you know, high school friends up here, I have family members, 
there's that one dude in the middle, my brother, who connects the two groups. Um, and they're completely separate from everybody else I know online, right? I have like that time I lived in Illinois and then that's it. Like they have no connection to the rest of my life. I have like my hockey team over here, a group of like girlfriends on the internet, like we met online. And then there is like this slightly bigger group that has like people I went to undergrad with. One of those guys happens to know a colleague here at the University of Maryland and then I have some professional colleagues. All right, so my network is really separated. But this actually becomes a really important issue. So we have different contexts that we interact with in the world, right? When I'm here presenting to you, when I'm on campus, I present myself one way, and it's very different than I act when I'm in the locker room with my hockey team, right? I'm not a totally different person, but we present ourselves differently. And when I'm talking to my internet friends, I say different things, and when I'm home with my family, I say different things. So we have these social contexts. But there's an issue on Facebook in that those contexts go away. And my colleague Jessica Vitak here at the University of Maryland studies this, and it has a term called context collapse. Facebook says you have friends, and that's it. It doesn't matter that they fall into these different groups. It's just flat. And so how do I decide what to share on Facebook, right? I find a lot of really awesome hockey links that I know everybody on my hockey team wants to see. And then there's maybe two or three other people in my life that want to see it. But none of those people at the University of Maryland know anything about hockey, and they don't care. So do I post the link or not? That's a lot of my friends that aren't going to be interested. At the same time, I'll get a lot of social capital with the people who are. Right? So how do I make these decisions? How do I present myself in all of these different contexts? I have it easy because I've got a bunch of groups and so I could jump through some loops and use some privacy tools and separate all these groups into lists. But then you look at people who are a little more typical. This is the network of one of my PhD students. And you notice that while there's some nicely different colored groups, there are hundreds of connections between those people. She went to high school in Maryland. She went to college in Maryland. She's going to graduate school in Maryland. And so there's a lot of people who are in all of those groups for her. Her high school friends are not separate from her college friends. Separating these groups out into nicely labeled packets is very difficult. It's not really possible. And so how do we handle this issue of wanting to build social capital, where we're sharing new and interesting things with people, and maintaining the way we present ourselves in different contexts. It's really tricky. Uh, one solution that a lot of people report for dealing with this is just having separate accounts. Um, I do this on Twitter. So I have a personal Twitter account where I tweet about like hockey games and things. I have a professional Twitter account where I tweet about stuff like this. And then I have a Twitter account for my dog. Um, she has more followers than either of my other two accounts combined. She has like 1,500 Twitter followers um, where I just post pictures of my dog. So, I mean, is that the right solution? I, I don't know because I had an awful lot of groups labeled in that picture I showed you of my Facebook network. Do I really want 12 Facebook accounts? And, you know, there's also the fact that some people will really be interested in all these things. When I post that I'm giving a TED Talk, a lot of people from different parts of my life want to know about that. So there's two kind of suggestions that I have. One is that as people who use social media, it's really important that we understand that it plays a critical role in our offline lives, right? The way we present ourselves online is not some separate world that doesn't carry into life offline. It really matters. And so we need to think about these issues of context and how we present ourselves in building social capital. And that means maybe we do think about things like having separate accounts, um, not necessarily 12 different accounts, but maybe Facebook is just for your personal friends, and you have LinkedIn, and you have Twitter, and maybe a couple Twitter accounts. This is something that it's worth thinking about. On the other side, there's suggestions that we have to have for social media companies or for developers to give us the tools to be able to manage that better. Social media is relatively new in the world, right? This emerged like in the mid-2000s, which is really new in terms of the technology. And we have allowed people to connect online, but we haven't caught up to having that online world represent how social interaction really works offline. And I think we need to take a lot of steps in that direction to have tools like the one I showed you that lets you see how many people have seen links and that makes it much easier to manage who do I want to show this content to and who do I maybe hold it back from just because they wouldn't be interested. 
So I hope what you take away from this is that social capital, social context, all those things we think about offline are truly important even when they're happening online and that it's something that we as users and hopefully technology developers will think about and make easier to deal with in the future. Thanks.